Welcome to This Week in Prophecy with James Jacob Prash, presented by Maury LTV. My name is Joshua here with James Jacob Prash coming this week from Sydney, Australia on Saturday, September 14th, 2019. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Welcome to This Week in Prophecies on behalf of all of Moriel Ministries. I'm in Sydney at the moment. We have meetings on Saturday the 14th, Sunday the 15th in Sydney, as well as upcoming meetings next week and the week after in Christchurch, New Zealand, Wellington, New Zealand, Napier, New Zealand, Hamilton, New Zealand, and then Auckland, New Zealand. The times and dates and locations are available on the Moriel website, moriel.org, or Moriel itineraries. Just go to the website, moriel.org, Click on the itineraries and we'll look forward to see you if you are in New Zealand or in the Sydney area. Be that as it may, let's move on with this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, a major announcement was made by Benjamin Netanyahu. Some have speculated it had political implications for the forthcoming election on Israel. In any event, it certainly has major international ramifications and it is important prophetically from the point of view of end time prophecy. The United States agreed, according to the Israeli government essentially, to allow Israel to exert its formal sovereignty over the Jordan Valley. That is to say the area parallel to the Jordan River, the de facto border between Israel and Jordan. Most of the West Bank, of course, lies between the Jordan and the pre-1967 borders of Israel. This would firmly entrench Israel, not only in terms of a security position to maintain strategic control of the valley, but exert its sovereignty. In other words, a virtual annexation. Now, if the United States goes along with this, it would be the first major step in a formal annexation of West Bank territory into greater Israel although we have de facto annexations already in such places as Male Adumim next to Jerusalem and in um, the areas of Tel Aviv, such as Ariel. Be that as it may, what is significant here is the American consent for Israel to do so, or at least not objecting to it. Putting the strategic importance of the Jordan Valley at the forefront of national security issues at this time, though, is uh, unusual, except in terms of its nationalist implications. What is important at the present time is what is taking place in Galilee and along the Gaza Strip. This week in prophecy, Hezbollah has downed an Israeli drone in southern Lebanon. And Hamas has downed a drone in Gaza. Hamas itself has launched a drone attack on Israel, albeit an unsuccessful one, and repeated rocket attacks this week. There is obviously some kind of a coordination orchestrated most probably, if not certainly, by Iran to increase border tensions in Lebanon using their surrogates of Hezbollah with Gaza using their semi-surrogates, Hamas, working in concert with each other under the direction of the Iranian regime. Israel, as you recall, last week in prophecy, launched an attack on a facility in Beirut controlled by Nasrallah and the Hezbollah entities operating in Lebanon. This week, however, things have stepped up and graduated. There have been repeated rocket attacks day after day on Ashkelon and on Ashdod, south of Tel Aviv. One of these high alerts of a rocket attack forced the emergency evacuation of of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu from the area out of the line of fire, working much the same as the President of the United States would be evacuated from any line of fire. In a national emergency, the local equivalent took place in Israel this week in prophecy. Israel responded, however, with 15 air raids, 15 air raids on 
Hamas targets in both northern and central Gaza. These included minor naval targets, munitions production and storage facilities. Israel has retaliated forcefully, but still with not the full force that it is capable of doing, and which the Israeli government has said it will do if these rocket attacks don't continue. But the graduation from rocket attacks into UAVs and into drone technology, obviously being provided by Iran, directly or indirectly, marks a step forward in conflict, both in Gaza and in Galilee. This week, prophecy, the Black Sea Resort of Sochi, saw meetings between Benjamin Netanyahu and the Russian defense minister, as well as Benjamin Netanyahu and once again Vladimir Putin. There have been a number of these meetings taking place every few months for over a year between Mr. Putin and Mr. Netanyahu. What is discussed at these meetings is always not clear. The specifics are never clear, but there is some kind of a coordinated effort between the Israelis and the Russians, indirectly involving the United States, to avoid armed conflict between Israel and Russia. Now, this would mitigate against those who are pushing the case that there is a Gog and Magog scenario coming in events in Syria. There may be eventually, but both Russia and Israel have been going out of their way to avoid it. We have always raised the possibility of there being two battles of Gog and Magog, not just the main one at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, which the New Testament speaks of. The main one must be that one, because that's the one addressed in the New Testament, but another one that prefigures it. And we don't disagree that this could be a possibility. There are credible reasons to make that case, such as the battlefield debris being cleaned up for seven months and so forth. However, some have been sensationalistic, have been overly ambitious almost in proclaiming that we are on the way or at the precipice of a Gog and Magog scenario a la Ezekiel 38 and 39, when in fact both Russia and Israel have vested interests in preventing it, as is witnessed in these periodic meetings taking place every few months, really every several weeks sometimes, between Mr. Putin and Mr. Netanyahu. Now again, they have conflicting interests, but they have a mutual interest in avoiding armed conflict with each other. That is what is taking place this week in prophecy. We urge people to avoid the crackpots and the alarmists and, and, and people like, like Craig White, who say that, Ahmed, that, that Erdogan from Turkey is the Antichrist and the stage is being set and this kind of a scenario is imminent. The facts show otherwise. Those people, to begin with, mishandle scripture and take license with it going to extraordinary degrees beyond what the text allows. But additionally, the geopolitical realities don't always fit like a glove the way they represent it to be. And the events that took place this week in prophecy in Shoshi at the Black Sea exemplify that reality. This week in prophecy, however, a high alert has persisted in Galilee. After the IDF attacked a again, Iranian-animated arms facility and depots at Abu Kamel. The retaliation by Iranian-backed forces against Israeli positions on Mount Hermon, very close to northern Galilee, set alarm bells ringing throughout Galilee with air raids and drills and military exercises prepared for any necessary response should that take place. The pro-Iranian group south of Damascus has regrouped again following the Israeli attacks on Abu Kamal. And again, this corresponds to their attacks that have taken place on Mount Hermon. It's a matter of posturing. Sometimes posturing ends in conflict. Sometimes it is de-escalated. We shall see what is happening, but it is happening this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, 
once again in the Middle East. Israel has announced it has found another nuclear facility south of the Iranian city of Isfahan. It was camouflaged as a carpet cleaning company or as a maintenance facility for a company that cleans and maintains carpets. The United Nations has essentially confirmed that the facility exists. They immediately dismantled it once it was uncovered by the Israelis and filled the area in with gavel, covered it with gavel. This highlights the accuracy of Israeli intelligence and how effective it continues to be in monitoring what's taking place in Iran. We do not know all of how they're doing it, but they're certainly doing it. And of course, the American NSA and satellite reconnaissance is involved in advising and assisting the Israelis as the Israelis advise and assist the American CIA, DIA, and NSA. This Week in Prophecy. This Week in Prophecy, we are seeing continued tensions in Hong Kong. Again, the ramifications of Hong Kong go beyond Hong Kong itself. The USA has threatened the unique special trade status of Hong Kong, which it deals with as a separate political and economic entity outside of mainland China as a special administrative region. This has been criticized by the governor of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, saying that interference by other parliamentary and foreign bodies, U.S. Congress among them and the American administration, is unconstructive and China is protesting it. This comes on the heels of the crackdown against dissidents and protesters in Hong Kong, as well as the Uyghur protests taking place in Western China and in Hong Kong. This week in Australia, I saw in Adelaide <coughs> a considerable number, several hundred Uyghur Muslims who are refugees from Western China protesting in Australia against the policies of the Chinese government. China remains afraid that what is happening in Hong Kong, what is happening with the Uyghurs, what is happening to a lesser degree but active and persistent degree with the Tibetans will overtake much of China, another Tiananmen Square type of uprising or protest against the government. This is the great fear in China. And any kind of economic calamity could trigger the social instability, facilitating a political and social reaction. This, again, would have tremendous ramifications for the world, for global trade, but also for the Middle East. We know this week in prophecy that it was divulged that China has an absolute fortune in Iranian oil beyond its surplus. The belt and trade policies of China as a form of foreign aid and that is really packaged as a loan but presented as assistance could give China control over $280 billion worth of Iranian oil. These loans could only be repaid in oil, but China already has too much Iranian oil. There are ships in Hong Kong Harbor, in Shanghai Harbor, unable to unload the Iranian oil they already have. This oil glut now affecting China has direct implications for Iran. Hence, when we look at Hong Kong, we have to look at China. When we look at China, we have to understand the ramifications of China for Iran. When we look at Iran, obviously, it has direct implications for the Persian Gulf, for the Arab Sunni states, and for Israel. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy. It was revealed that Iran has reactivated 30 new centrifuges for Iranian enrichment. This, again, is posturing and saber-rattling. 
the government and the regime of Iran with the mullahs trying to scare the European continental powers into defying American leadership and making concessions to the Iranians economically as their currency and their economy continues to be hurt by the American sanctions, as well as by the oil glut in China. These centrifuges needed for uranium enrichment are crucial to the manufacture or assembly of any kind of fissionable device that could be a, requiring weapons-grade plutonium. This week in Prophecy, we have a situation emerged that emerged in Washington that is rather confusing. John Bolton has been a figure of which conservatives have had a love-hate relationship for some time. On one hand, they've loved his firm attitude against Russian aggression and against radical Islamic aggression and against Islamic countries who compromise with radical Islam. We've all loved that since he's been the UN ambassador. On the other hand, he is definitively a neocon or considered to be one. He is an establishment Republican who, who was originally an appointee of the Bush administration that was in bed with the Saudi Arabians. He has not accepted the responsibility of the neocons, including himself, for looking for regime change in the Middle East without having an alternative for it. In other words, no one liked Gaddafi in Libya. No one liked him. But he was scared. He was afraid of his position. The Obama administration and the French essentially aided and assisted in his being deposed. And of course, we have the whole fiasco with Hillary Clinton and the Americans being killed and Obama and Clinton lying about the time frame in which these events took place. It was an absolute terrible mess that took place in Benghazi, for which we can thank Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration. Nonetheless, Gaddafi was disarming. Gaddafi was rolling back his own nuclear ambitions. Gaddafi made it clear he was willing to play ball with the West and with the United States particularly. Not necessarily with Israel, but certainly with the West and with the United States, with NATO. The prize of deposing him was a momentary celebration. But after he went, the door was open for a mass migration of Islamic and African refugees via Libya into southern Europe, particularly via Italy. This has created a huge mess. Together with the refugee crisis from Syria, Europe is being flooded, howbeit with the welcoming arms of Angela Merkel and her policies that have proved increasingly unpopular in Germany. This flood of immigrants from Libya is only one aspect, however, of what happened in post-Gaddafi Libya. Another has been Al-Qaeda and ISIS have both become reactivated in the instability of that environment once the strongman Gaddafi is gone. Again, everyone wants to see the end of a Gaddafi, providing you have someone to replace him. But the neoconservatives, like the Obama administration, both have this idea of regime change without giving sufficient th forethought to what would come after you depose the person you don't like. This resulted in a near catastrophe in Egypt, although the government there was not inimical to the United States. The Mubarak regime was not one we disliked. If it wasn't for General Assisi, who Barack Obama disliked, preferring the Muslim Brotherhood, basically a terrorist-supporting organization, that's how far to the left and how anti-Israel and arguably anti-American the Obama administration had become. Assisi saved Egypt, but Assisi is in Egypt, 
Who is in Libya? Nobody. This originally was the strategy of the neocons, of the pseudo-conservative right centrist establishment Republicans led by people like Paul Wolfowitz and uh, Crystal and, and John Bolton being one of them. No one was sorry to see the end of Saddam Hussein. But what would happen after he went? There was no other fixed alternative to bringing stability to that country. And instability has reigned ever since. Of course, the Petraeus plan for a surge did temporarily bring restability, but that was ultimately destroyed by Barack Obama when he removed the residual American forces again without an interim plan resulting in the rise of the ISIS caliphate, destroyed since by Donald Trump. You can get rid of somebody you don't like, providing you have somebody better to replace them. These faulty policies that were in both the Obama administration and in the establishment Republican administration of the Bush dynasty is where John Bolton came from. We all liked him, but we all disliked him. He's gone this week. Hypocritically, however, many, many left-wing Democrats who deplored his appointment as national security advisor are today deploring his removal by President Trump. It's about politics. It's not about policy. It's just the usual hypocrisy of inside the Capitol Beltway. It does, however, have ramifications for Israel and the Middle East. And what has ramifications for Israel and the Middle East always has ramifications for scriptural prophecy and the return of Christ. Let us continue. This week in prophecy, in Iraq, it is the anniversary, the annual celebration of the Battle of Karbala, where Shia Muslim pilgrims flock to Karbala to commemorate the death, they say, martyrdom of Ali Hussein, a descendant of Mohammed. We understand that the Shia Muslims believe the leadership of Islam should have gone through Ali Hussein, that is, the family of Muhammad, while Sunni Muslims look to Abu Bakr and the theocrats surrounding Muhammad as the leadership of Islam. This led to the split. This split, however, was further aggravated by ethnic tensions and traditional hatred between Persians, that is Iranians, who are largely Shia, and Arabs, who are largely Sunni. This week in prophecy, however, something took place once again that has happened multiple times elsewhere. Dozens of Muslims were killed and hundreds hurt in a human stampede in Kabbalah this week. The way this is celebrated is people begin to beat and smack themselves and even practice autoflagellation. The Roman Catholic Crusades saw this practice and they brought it back to medieval Europe in the Dark Ages. Hence, monks and nuns began imitating the Muslims with autoflagellation because in Roman Catholicism, the blood of Christ does not cleanse from all sin. You must atone for your own in purgatory they think they can make a down payment through this kind of corporal mortification of themselves in imitation of Shia Muslims. It is a frightening sight to behold, but in southern Lebanon and in Iran, you see mothers bringing little boys, even four or five years old, having their heads hatched open with hatchets by Islamic clergymen to let the blood flow in memoration in commemoration and memorial of the Battle of Kabbalah and of Ali, this relative of Mohammed, who they considered to be a martyr. They actually mutilate their children 
and hack the children's heads open, their own mothers dragging them before these bearded mullahs. It is a completely barbarian practice. It is looked down upon by Sunni Muslims, yet it takes place with a kind of religious frenzy that would resemble a mass demonization. Well, this week in prophecy, it happened and resulted in a human stampede killing dozens. We don't have the exact figures. This is not the first time this has happened. There have been at least three occasions where there have been major human stampedes in Mecca at the Hajj. In one alone through a pedestrian tunnel, 1,500, 1,500 Muslims were trampled to death by other Muslims during the Hajj. Now Muslims will have to say, Inja Allah, Inja Allah. It was Allah's perfect will that this happened. This is a troubled situation, a troubled religion, and a troubled cultural mentality. How can such terrible things be attributed to the perfect will of a God who you come to worship? In Judeo-Christian thought, God allows such things, but it's not his perfect will. In Islam, it is quite different. It is Inja Allah, and it was Inja Allah this week in prophecy. On one hand, they're mourning these people trampled to death. On the other hand, they have to say, Allah desired it to happen. And it happened this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, events concerning Brexit continue to dominate European news, again with ramifications for the global economy and the United States. This week in prophecy, Daniel chapter 2, the Brexit crisis continues, and it has reached crisis proportions in Great Britain with ramifications certainly for the EU throughout Europe, but also for the global markets, including the United States. Boris Johnson stated, quote unquote, tie my hands, but do not delay Brexit. Parliament has been suspended to the 14th of October. There are legal challenges to this, but seeking a delay is a strategy of desperation of the pro-European elements in the British establishment to try to prevent Britain from leaving the EU at the scheduled date in October. This will almost certainly force an election. Jeremy Corbyn, however, the Labour leader who was a anti-Israel figure, many would say an anti-Semitic figure, favors elections, but he does not want an election without a delay of Brexit to leave with some kind of an agreement with the Brussels bureaucracy. This is, of course, most effective the Republic of Ireland where Leo Varadkar, the Irish Taoiseach or Prime Minister, looking for specific propositions concerning what will happen to Anglo-Irish relations if there is a no-deal Brexit taking place next month. So intense has this become that we see something happening now in Britain that's happening in Washington. The political establishment particularly the left, are talking about an impeachment of the prime minister for violating the law in not revoking the suspension of parliament, even though a parliamentary action required him to reinitiate Brexit talks at the present time and preventing any Brexit without an agreement. It is legally and politically complicated, but it's interesting how impeachment becomes a political tool in Great Britain, the same as it becomes a political tool in Washington, and the same as it has been a political tool concerning Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel. We see the same things taking place all over the world. Watch events in Great Britain over the next several weeks 
They are important to Daniel chapter 2 and to prophecy. This week in prophecy. Thank you so much for listening, dear friends. Be blessed in Jesus. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you this week from Sydney, Australia, hoping to see you in Sydney this weekend and in New Zealand over the next two weeks. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.